The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. In this video, we're going to be tearing down a nice 8-bit computer. I've got to be really honest about this one. Uh, I'm really worried about two things here. First of all, it's a case of don't meet your heroes. When I was at primary school, this is the computer we had in every class, the BBC microcomputer, in this case, Model B. It's literally my first experience in computing and I really hope it's not a case of don't meet your heroes because I have fond memories of this, us fighting to get to the class to play Granny's Garden. I'm worried it won't live up to my expectations. Now, the second reason I'm worried is because I'm slightly worried this is going to be the trigger for an obsession and I'm going to turn into somebody that is just obsessed with 8-bit and vintage computing and everything of about that era. Greetings programs, I'm here, you're there. Welcome back to Unlock 14 Presents and I can't pull off the cool Californian thing, can I? First thing I should say is that this BBC was bought with a failed power supply. It was in use and then the power supply let out the magic smoke. So after we've done the tear down, done a little bit of checking, I'm gonna do a recap on the PSU, see if we can get some life out of it again. Otherwise it is sadly a relic for the bin, unless we pull out some of the chips and uh, anybody wants it. Uh, right, just to sort of get us up to speed, Beautiful, beautiful, and a proper keyboard, full size for those little chubby fingered children like myself back in the 80s. And it still feels good today. All right, this particular one feels like it mm, could probably do with a bit of a clean, but that full movement proper keyboard is lovely. At the top, you've got a uh, user replaceable and programmable function keys under this lovely clear bit of Perspex. And uh, there's a hint of one of the games we can already play on this, Elite. And you've got some shortcut keys inside the game. And this little patch or perforated section of the keyboard here, we'll come back to when we get inside. Now, for anybody not familiar, we'll just run around the ports quickly. So starting here, we've got the PSU with the power switch. Moving across, there is an Econet network port, which was an optional extra for some models. Uh, you then have a, an analog input, which I believe you could use for joysticks. And inside you'll see a DAC. We've got some DIN connectors for cassette, RS232 or serial, or 432 for serial. An RGB output for a monitor, a component output, and finally a TV tuner output. Now, that doesn't seem like very many ports for a computer of this time, but then you get underneath, and very cleverly, away from those same pokey-fingered children, are some expansion ports. Now, there's disk drive. Simple enough, we can understand that. Printer, again, not too complicated. Auxiliary power output, which could power the disk drive. I believe there were printers that were compatible with that as well. Uh, user port, so that can be used for joysticks, things like that. A one megahertz bus, which is uh, an expansion port, and also the tube, which was an Acorn uh, custom expansion port. And I understand that people online in recent years have hacked that to apply a dual processor. This was originally designed, one iteration of it had a second CPU, but it was scrubbed for cost. However, you can add one back in using that tube port, which is, if we can get this working, definitely something I'm gonna waste way too many hours doing. So let's start taking this apart. You'll notice we've gone for the full size tools today, not the uh, miniatures. I don't know if that's a sign, a positive sign or not, but uh, it certainly makes life easy for me. So we start with these two screws on the bottom. There goes the serial number, which was clearly held on by a screw. And the other two screws are on the back. And with that, we're in. It's so nice to have something that easy to disassemble and it's kind of important because there are user replaceable and serviceable parts inside. This is one of the few sort of electronics that you would really want to get inside and I guess actually that still applies today with computers for memory upgrades. Um, but yeah, you can, you can start to see the uh, discoloration of the plastics here. It's, it's browned and bad but it's not 
that brown and bad compared to how it started. So inside we've got the beautiful PC speaker, which is excellent for all those particular bleeps and bloops. Uh, again, we've got this lovely mechanical keyboard. And to get that out, it's just two more screws. So from underneath, we've got some screws, but these actually go into bolts. So I have to kind of hold that at the same time. Okay. Now, if you are wondering, it's the BBC computer made by Acorn. This was part of a 1980s scheme by the British Broadcasting Corporation, yes, the same people that do the news and things, to increase computer literacy. Now, this came off the success of a program in the 70s, I believe, to improve literacy among the uh, British populace. And they wanted to do the same with computing. So they teamed up and went out to tender to find uh, a cheap, serviceable computer which could teach primary school age children computing. And this was the winner of that tender. And sure enough, it's what I cut my teeth on. Now, the first thing I notice about this keyboard these days is the fact that the F and the J don't have the dimples on them, so you can't align yourself with touch typing, which I think is weird when you're teaching this academically, you'd want to encourage touch typing. And I can remember using touch typing software at primary school. So the fact that this didn't have the bits is just a bit kind of incongruent. And sure enough, we've got some ICs on here. I'm pretty sure most of those are gonna be multiplexers um, to make the matrix, which then runs back to the motherboard. Now. What I was getting at on this front panel with the perforations up here, uh, that's actually so you can externally replace an internal ROM. Bear with me here. So you could add another dip socket onto the edge of the keyboard here, remove that perforated section, and that would actually, with the use of some additional headers, add an extra ROM, but you could have a user replaceable zero insertion force or ZIF socket on the outside with a little lever, so you could replace ROMs without having to take the case off. Some of the programs that came with this were more than a 32K RAM and a floppy disk could manage. So you had to have a ROM to be able to enable you to use that software. And that's one of the ways that you could quickly replace it. So straight away, we are into the motherboard and you can see how beautifully made, but still how simple this is as a PC, all on a single board. Power supply is modular and replaceable. So if we still can't get it working, replacing the mother power supply completely is an option. And again, all of these power supplies, I think there are six, seven pins on here, are labeled. So you get the VCC and the zero volts on each pin, just so you get the black and the red. And you can't really get it wrong because the length of each lead will only let you put it in one place. And look at this motherboard. Now again, obviously these are the ports that go out underneath. Now these five sockets over here are for the ROMs. Now it loads up the ROMs from right to left in order of priority. So whatever you put in here is gonna be its lead ROM that it boots. Now on here, the two here and here are the sort of the BIOS, the hardware to make it run, and also the basic ROM. And I have to say, I never learned basic. Uh, the teachers always booted it up and loaded programs for us. I have never had a machine that ran basic, so never needed to learn it. But if we get this working again, I'm sure it's something I'm gonna sink countless hours into. And this DNFS ROM inserted here is the disk and network file system. So this enables you to use the external floppy disk and would also enable us to use that Econet network port. Now, obviously you can see all these unpopulated uh, chips around here. This board obviously didn't come with an Econet functionality. I'm gonna slide that together. So there is the motherboard. Copyright 1982, and this is an issue seven board by Acorn Computers. So this thing is much older than I am. Well. All right, it's older than I am. Oh man. Again, we've seen this before with certain age of PCB where one side goes all in one direction. And this side, presumably, you can just about see it. All the traces actually run left to right apart from ones that run out to the ports. So all these vias that go through the board right down here will be bridging the gap between vertical and horizontal traces. So while we are at it, let's get the PSU out, which is hopefully the offending article to why this doesn't work. And it's a reasonably straightforward fix with a recap, as in replacing the capacitors, not covering something again. I've made that association before. Now, what I don't know is 
when this did pop, will it have been something visible that we can just see and diagnose? Or will this be something that we can really see? Good old 13 amp plug, can't beat them. Dust and mank all over the place. So here is the offending PSU and yeah. Yeah, I would say this one microfarad cap just on the inside on the incoming side of the power supply is looking a bit, a bit popped. <laughs> is that the technical term? Okay, before I finish this manoeuvre, I should say that this power supply has been unplugged and left untouched for a month, maybe? I haven't tried to buy, power this on since I bought it. It has been just left deliberately for the capacitors to discharge if that's what they need. Okay, there we go. So, <laughs> interesting construction where you've got this um, metal case, but it's got a sheet of Paxilene at the bottom to isolate the bottom of the PCB, just to make sure there's no contact between that and the case. But yeah, I would say, I don't know about you, but that one microfarad in there looks rather dead and let's assume that this fuse has gone as well. Actually, the fuse looks intact, so hopefully it hasn't completely destroyed the PSU and the computer with it, with a nice big overcurrent. So a nice switched mode power supply which apparently was not part of the original BBC spec because BBC and obviously these were going to be filmed for television. There was an accompanying TV series that went with these to help people learn to code. Um, that meant that the BBC didn't want the switch mode power supply because they could introduce electronic noise into the recording studio, apparently. It's a bit niche. But yeah, that's, that's, that's the contents of a BBC micro. So you've got the main motherboard the power supply and the keyboard, that seems almost too easy. It, it shouldn't be possible to make it do what it can do with so few components. And what I really love about this is the quality of the layout of the motherboard. I mean, this is teachable. I mean, even I can understand what's going on here. And again, it's one of those in theory that you could buy all these components and solder it up yourself. It's not so complicated, it's beyond control. And right here in dead in the center, you've got a MOS Technologies 6502 processor, which I understand runs at two megahertz. Now over here, you've got the system clock and all the memory. And this is one of the clever things because PCs at the time often had shared video and graphics memory. And obviously this Model B came with 32K of RAM, which needed to be accessed by the graphics and the CPU. Now to achieve that, most systems at the time slowed down the memory or had the memory running at the same system bus and it meant that you only got half the speed of the processor and the video at the time that they both needed to access RAM. However, in here, the RAM runs at four megahertz, whereas the CPU and the graphics all run at two megahertz. So you didn't have that bottleneck or that throttling of memory. It's really simple, really effective, but for an education machine, it seems too good to be true. It's, it's something you'd expect in higher end machines of the time. So like I said, down here, we've got the ROM sockets and over here, you've got two optional sockets. Now understand that they held um, some extra ROM and a voice synthesizer chip. So that enabled you to have the speech output. And again, if I get really into this, I've got a horrible feeling I'm gonna start seeking out those chips and trying to program stuff up and wasting my life writing software for a machine which has been out of fashion for 30 odd years. But it's just so easy to see why you can get into this and understand it. And the other thing that worries me about this machine is it's got a wonderful way of combining machine code uh, uh, or assembly with basic and you can write them both in line in a single program to control the hardware at a low level and i've never done basic and i've never done assembly and the fact that you can do both of these on here and get that rudimentary understanding i i can just picture me wasting my life on this machine in the most positive way i can imagine but it's really nice that you can still find lots of documentation on this. I've found layouts online which tell me what every single PCB and IC on here does and what you can put in there and what the options were. There are even instructions on how to make your own custom ROMs that can integrate the uh, synthesizer chip. It's a great machine and 
I'm really hoping that I can get the power supply repaired enough that I can play with it and relive some of my childhood memories. For me, it's a big nostalgia trip, but it's a great learning tool. 23rd of November, 1983, which puts this machine firmly three years older than me. And here I am hopefully gonna save its life. Either way, that's all I've got time for in my full electronics inside slot. Thank you so much for watching. If you are a glutton for punishment and you really want to see me try and recap this machine, head over to the Element 14 community where we'll post a video of me trying to do just that. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.